Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and you're listening to the Bible in a Year podcast, where we encounter God's voice and live life through the lens of Scripture. The Bible in a Year podcast is brought to you by Ascension. Using the Great Adventure Bible Timeline, we'll read all the way from Genesis to Revelation, discovering how the story of salvation unfolds and how we fit into that story today. Speaking of today and speaking of Genesis to Revelation, we are now launching ahead. We just are in the midst of this time period, but we are jumping all the way to the Gospel of John in the New Testament. It's our first of four messianic checkpoints. So one of the things that this comes out of is the idea or the reality essentially that as we're going through the Bible timeline, right, following these 14 narrative books, we recognized that if we just kept going through from beginning to the end, we wouldn't be reading any of the New Testament until roughly November. And so we thought, wow, it would be very, very important to introduce to all of us in the midst of this year, a number of times where we get to take a step back and actually kind of launch forward and see, okay, now how has all of this been leading to Christ? Because all the Old Testament is pointing to the New Testament. All the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus, who is the fulfillment of everything. And so for the next seven days, we are going to be walking through the Gospel of John. And in order to introduce the Gospel of John, so we can get kind of a an understanding, once again, of John and of the structure of John's gospel and how unique John's gospel is. Once again, we're joined by Jeff Cavins, which we're super grateful to talk with Jeff about John. Hey, Father. Good. Good to join you. And what a what a treat it is to look at a gospel at this at this point. It's like a it's a little bit of a reprieve, isn't it? You're going through all this history and yeah, but what about Jesus? But what about Jesus? And here we are, we're gonna jump ahead uh, for the gospel of John. So this is gonna be great. So good. Yeah. It's such a, I'm so grateful for the opportunity, even just to see here is where the whole thing points, you know, as, as I know you, I think you might've even been the first person to point out this quote from St. Augustine. I think it's St. Augustine, right? You can correct me on this one is that the um, old Testament is revealed in the new and the new Testament is, is hidden in the old. Right. And, and that's, that's one of the things that I love about, well, all of the new Testament and old Testament, but like when it specifically comes to the gospel of John, there's a number of like just really critical connections that are fulfillments in John's gospel of all the stuff that we've been reading and some things we'll be reading in the future. But there are so many, I think the people who have been journeying with us for these last number of days will hear John's gospel and in an entirely new way, knowing all of the, all that they know now, having walked mm-hmm. through Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and all that we've been through. I think this is going to be just a unique experience of going journeying through John. Sure, it it will be, and there's a couple of things to remember. And and one is that all scripture that you have been reading, and uh, in the case of uh, our listeners, all the scripture you have heard up till now, is all Christocentric, meaning it finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ, and uh, and that's what Bible study is all about. And the other thing is what Pope Benedict. Uh, mentioned, and um, and that's called recapitulative history. It's a big fancy word for Jesus came and did it again. You know, he 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 came and he relived those stories. And so as you as you start to read the Gospels now, um, keep in mind that this is about fulfilling something, and it's uh, it's about the the Son of God fulfilling what the firstborn Son did not did not complete. And so Jesus had to fulfill all righteousness. He had to complete this. And, uh, and then uh, we have some guidelines you know, in the catechism about it being a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And that's where, that's where we get to today with the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John is, is different. Everybody knows there's four Gospels. And the question would come up, well, wouldn't it have been okay to just do maybe one? <laughs> just had one. Just one, <laughs> one tells the whole story. Right, right. But but the reason for that is that all four Gospels have a different emphasis, and, and some of the Gospels share stories. So, for example, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke seem to be sharing material, the same stories, the same miracles, that some of the dialogue. And so, John stands out because John is really different than those other three Gospels, uh, not to mention that that uh, John is really for more of a universal audience. But there is an emphasis on each of the Gospels. In Matthew, we see Jesus as king. In Mark, we see Jesus as the servant. In Luke, we see Jesus, the man, 
the humanity. And in John, we see God, Jesus as God. In fact, you know, in Matthew's gospel, it starts off with a genealogy and it goes back to a son of David, whereas John starts off and says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. <laughs> and so it starts off with the divinity of God of Jesus. A few other things that are really interesting as people are going to go through this with you, there's only eight miracles recorded in John, and, and six of those miracles are they're very peculiar to, to John. John doesn't have any parables, whereas Matthew had nine of them. Luke had 35 parables. He taught very much in a, in a Hebraic way that way. But one of the things that's beautiful about John is that every single chapter provides kind of a separate portrait of who Christ is and, and what, he, what he has demonstrated as far as being God. And so you could say that the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they tell us uh, what Jesus did. John tells us who he is in a, in a real beautiful way. Another thing that's interesting is that John, over one-third of John's gospel, chapters 12 through 19, covers the last week of Jesus. And so it really focuses on that, that crucial work that he did, that centerpiece of his, his death, burial, and resurrection. That, that's, gonna, that's a really, really important point. And uh, our response to the Gospel of John is the word believe. <laughs> and that word believe is used many, many times because as John is, is showing you that Jesus is God, Jesus is the key to salvation, then the onus is upon us to respond to it. And that is called faithfulness or we believe we believe uh the truth yeah and 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 that sense of um how john make also makes that connection between belief and obedience uh, and a lack of belief and disobedience when it comes to I mean, even even the classic slash powerful kernel the the most you know the heart of the gospel in john chapter 3 verse 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only son that all who might believe in him might not perish but might have eternal life but then mm -hmm. it goes on to say but some disobeyed and and that sense that illuminates what it truly is to believe in the context not only of i i assent with my intellect but also i i say yes with with my will i actually choose what God has commanded. I, if you love me, you'll do what I have commanded you. you you'll mm -hmm. obey me. And there's that, that connection between, in John's gospel, so powerfully between faith and the way we actually are living right now, which is just so necessary for, for the Christian life as well. You know, one of the things that always strikes me about John's gospel is not just, as you noted, uh, there's not too many miracles and not any parables, but how thoroughly full of Jesus is teaching just direct teaching just it's you know whether that's the last supper discourse uh the high, you know high priestly prayer that time during the last supper how much jesus is teaching that last night uh before his betrayal and before his suffering and passion mm -hmm. yeah you mentioned the high priestly prayer in chapter 17 that is that is an amazing prayer that when we get to that uh we'll see that we are our focus of that that he prays that we would be one as he and the father are one and that's, that's very, very powerful. You know, that every time I hear the Gospel of John, I'm reminded of Pope John Paul II, because uh, John Paul II, he did Lexio Divina on the Gospel of John every month of his pontificate. So you could say that he literally owned it. He owned that Gospel. And that's something that I would really encourage people to do is choose one of the Gospels and own it. You know, really get to know it. Memorize, and memorize the main theme of every chapter. Now, John is great for that because every chapter, as I said earlier, is a portrait, really, of who Jesus is. Jesus is. So, you have the very famous nine I am statements in, in, uh, in, of Jesus. So, John says uh, about Jesus, I am the bread of, of life in John 6, and I am the light of the world, John 8. And also in John 8, before Abraham was, I am in, in John 10, I am the door. John 10, I am the good shepherd. John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And John 15, I am the true vine. And John 18, I am 
he. And so, and John seems to enjoy doing this because when he later wrote, when he later wrote the uh, book of Revelation, he also picked up on that as well and, uh, and uses, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I am the first and last. I am he who lives and was dead. And I am, I am he who searches and reigns in, in hearts. And I am the root and offspring of David. And I am the bright morning star. So he, John is just really into revealing who he is and his divinity. And I think that that is, is beautiful. The, the one verse that really caps it all off in John is John 10, 30, where Jesus said, I and, and I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. And he who has seen me, in John 14, has seen the Father. End of case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's that, that, that it makes it so clear that Jesus is uh, making the connection. Uh, that I mean, who he believes himself, who he knows himself, not just believes himself, who he knows himself to be. And he knows mm-hmm. himself to be, I, as you said, I and the Father are one. And uh, before Abraham was, I am. And all those those pieces, in, as we heard in the book of Exodus, how God reveals his sacred name, I am. And here is Jesus who who takes that and claims it for himself. Now, there's, there's a piece of, if you recall, in the last chapter of John's gospel, when after Jesus has risen from the dead and mm-hmm. Peter and some of the other guys are out there fishing on the, on the lake, that they catch a certain number of fish. And is there a little kind of like insider baseball here when it comes to <laughs> that certain number of fish that, that could also be a pointing to Jesus's identity? Yes, there, there actually is. And, and you, you bring up an odd point, right? And it's, it says, it, <laughs> it, says is an odd in, point. <laughs> it is in John 21, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of large fish. And John wanted you to know how many. So, I mean, right. either he's, either he's so really strange. got a thing with numbers or he is trying to show you something. It's 153 fish. Thank you, John. Because that story would have been incomplete without that number. 153 fish, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Yes, you're right. Um, numbers mean something to the Jewish people. And in the Hebrew language, there actually is not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. They actually use the alphabet to depict the numbers. And so every letter has a numerical value. And when you put the phrase, the, the phrase, I am God, in Hebrew, it comes up to the equivalent of 153. And, and that is a, an amazing revelation. And uh, I guess you could call it a, um, a Hebraic type of teaching where John is showing you that there was 153 fish. Let's well, see, 153, what would that mean? Oh, I'm God. I thought something was fishy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and it's just one of those things where, right, where the, the Bible has so many different layers to it. And, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, we'll be going through all of John's gospel in only seven days. And so the next number of days for those who've been journeying with us are going to be pretty full. They're going to be full with the story. But I, the thing I love about that is it means that we get to allow the entire story of John's gospel to kind of just wash over us in many ways, just to be able to take it in, knowing that I won't be able to take it all in, kind of like the previous 90 days or so, I will not be able to take all of this in. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to allow in whatever can get in. And so I might miss the 153 thing. I might miss some of the other pieces of uh, the these stories of John's gospel. But, but to realize in one week, I will have heard a gospel in its entirety, which I think is is just just a blessing, and I think it's something that all of us can be looking forward to. You know, you mentioned that um, 153 fish, and it, I mean, you're teaching me something here too, and that is that, you know, we were talking about John is really speaking about the divinity of Christ, and here at the very end of it, at the point, uh, and I'll just ma- mention this, this is after Peter betrayed the Lord three times. He let the Lord down three times. He was the first pope, and... He, you know, he did not serve the Lord the way he was supposed to, and he actually went back to fishing. That's what he's doing up in Galilee, and Jesus, Jesus says, no, you still have that calling on your life, and that's where he reveals the 153 fish, which is in Hebrew, ani Elohim, 
Ani Elohim, I am God. Ani is 61. Uh, Elohim is 92 for a total of 153. And I think that that is showing us that God is still God even after we've blown it. Yeah. And and maybe people reading with you during this time feel like, you know, I, I just haven't been the the servant of God or the husband or the or the son that I should have been. Well, this is the book where where you have a chance to begin afresh. And Jesus says to you, Lech Acharai, come follow me. Yeah, yeah, that fear of am I disqualified? Okay. I I know my I know I know what I've done. I know what I was maybe even at some point as a as a follower of Christ, I know what he's called me to, and the dignity is bestowed upon me. But have I disqualified myself? And am I am I done? Uh, he's going to go on without me, and he's going to do what he does because he's God and he's still he's still God. He'll get someone um, else. Yeah, yeah. Or is it? Or is it? Nope. Um, not you're not disqualified. You're restored. And and that's those last chapters of John's Gospel was so so again important for us because I think um, if you haven't been in a place yet where you feel like you've disqualified yourself when it comes to belonging to the Lord or serving the Lord, just wait, <laughs> because I think most of us get to that place. And that's where we need to hear, again, the Lord speak to Simon Peter and ask, do you love me? Okay, now feed my sheep. Let me restore you. You're not disqualified. You are restored. And that's mm-hmm. such a gift. As we conclude this episode, uh, Jeff, any kind of, as I always ask, any, any takeaways mm-hmm. as people can launch into these this next seven days of John's gospel? Yes, absolutely. Abso- absolutely. Right in the middle of the gospel of John, you have John chapter seven and John chapter eight. And uh, it's the story of the woman caught in adultery mm-hmm. and the leadership wants to stone her. And they, and they are shaming her, and she is broken and uh, publicly shamed. And it's in that amazing story that the Lord releases her from that shame and brings her to himself. And so I would really encourage people, you know, whatever shame in your life, uh, it doesn't have to be what this lady committed. It can be uh, shame um, in your town, shame in your family, shame for something you said, shame for something you did in college, whatever it might be. I want you to know that that Jesus is not going to hold you to that shame the rest of your life, but he is going to release you because he can He's God. He is divine, and that's what the focus is, and, and, and that's just not a theological point. That is an experience that we can have in our life. Because he's God, I can be free from shame. Maybe it was something on the internet. Who knows? But you can be free and be restored to the Lord, whether you are someone listening to the daily readings or you're the Pope. <laughs> right. And if, if the Pope's listening. <laughs> <laughs> he's just brushing up on his English. That's that's, how, right, that's right. why he's listening to the Bible, right? For all that's of us. so good, and that I think that's a great word to uh, to not just end this episode on, but to launch into the Gospel of John with, which is that sense of uh, I remember hearing someone describe that said that the guilt is when I know that I've failed to live up to a standard, and so you know I've, I've the standard of being honest, and I wasn't honest, so I'm guilty. But but shame is when you see that I've failed to live up to that standard that that I'm I'm not just that I'm guilty in your eyes so it's a relational kind of a situation and and, and just what the the healing there or the remedy there with the woman caught in adultery is she stands before or is on the ground before Jesus and Jesus sees her and knows her and loves her and as he says I, I forgive you I don't condemn you I go and sin no more and that being seen Allowing ourselves to be seen is one of the most powerful remedies for shame. And maybe not by everybody, but definitely uh, by the Lord. Ah, so I'm so glad you brought that up as we launch into John's gospel. Um, it's going to be good. Jeff, you will, you'll still have the, uh, your Facebook uh, group that will continue to meet on Thursdays. Yeah, every, we answer about three to five questions every week that you, the listeners, are asking. And, and usually it's, boy, I don't understand this, or how could God do that? And we try to take those apart as best we can, and always coming from the perspective of we trust God, and God is good. He's not, ar- he's not arbitrary. He doesn't just do one thing one day and another another day. He's consistent, and his actions are always held to who he is. Yeah, which is so yeah, good. And, you good. know, because the commentaries each day— um, 
they're they're almost they're limited. They're incred- incredibly limited, not only in time but also in my own uh, wisdom and knowledge. And so I'm so grateful that every week uh, those who are journeying with us have the opportunity uh, to get your wisdom and your guidance. So. Uh, that and that's the what we're doing now. We're we're on this journey, and so we need each other. Uh, it's mm-hmm. not just about uh, uh, ourselves. It's not just down to us. It's not just down to one person or even a couple people. It's it's the whole community of us who are allowing God's word to shape our hearts and to form our vision, so that oh, yeah. we can not only see like God sees and love like God loves, but truly live how God has called us to live. And so, in order to do that. We need grace. We need his help. And so keep praying for each other. Keep praying for me. I am praying for you with Jeff Gavins. My name is Father Mike. I cannot wait to see you tomorrow. God bless.